first when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, brother, we'll be glad. Keep on the fiery line. How we'll praise the Savior for the call we had. Keep on the fiery line. When we see the souls that we have left to I want to ask you to take your Bibles with me uh, this morning, if you would, and turn to 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Now, that's going to be at the back of your Bible. I want you to turn there with me, and we're going to be reading two verses. And if you could and you are able to stand with me as we read these verses, I would greatly appreciate that as well as we honor and reverence the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 11 and 12. Now let me give you a real quick background of this passage of Scripture. Peter wrote 1st and 2nd Peter to the church that was scattered everywhere. They were under great persecution at this particular time. History tells us that Nero was the emperor of Rome. And he had accused the Christians of burning Rome down. And it wasn't the Christians. But I'm telling you, they were caught up in all of this. And they are under such stress and such hardship in their life. So I want you to know, as Peter is writing this, he is writing to try to encourage his brothers and sisters in Christ. This morning as I pass through the congregation and I have shaken hands or spoken, I have had three or four folks that have asked me to pray about particular things that's going on in their life, that's happening in their families, things that they are struggling with. Uh, and today I believe that this message will be fitting, will be helpful. To remind us that even in the midst of our darkest and our most difficult times, we have a God who cares. He has not forgotten us. He has not overlooked us. He remembers us. But you may be here this morning and you may be questioning, Preacher, sometimes I just wonder if it's even worth it to live this life. To try to do what is right when all of these things happen wrongly in our life. May today God comfort you. May today you find a word from God to strengthen you and to encourage you. And to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Look with me. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse number, uh, verse number 11. Dearly beloved. I beseech you as strangers and as pilgrims that you abstain from fleshly lust, which are warring against your soul, having your conversation or having your conduct honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word this morning. 
May today, Lord, we glean from your word the very thing, Father, that you have for us. Prepare our hearts. May we prepare ourselves to receive this word. And may our teacher, the Holy Spirit, apply it into our life and encourage our hearts in this moment in time. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are and all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. And may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You remember who this writer is, don't you? Some 30 years previous, he was the one who infamously denied Jesus three times. And I'm probably sure that every time that Peter, from that day, every time that Peter would hear a rooster crow, it would remind him of what he did that day, that time when he was under the gun. He was that follower of Christ who at times was impulsive, sometimes he was selfish, and we read sometimes where he was even short-tempered as a follower of Christ. When some look at Peter's life before the resurrection, I probably would think that some people would figure that Peter washed out. He didn't make it. He didn't fulfill what he should have done. But catch what he's doing here. Here he is sitting down in the city of Rome, and he's writing a letter of encouragement to the people of God who are scattered throughout northern Turkey, and he's writing them this letter of comfort. Those who are under severe persecution by the Roman Empire, and they are experiencing all kinds of trials of great pain and trauma in their life. But Peter wanted them to know something. He did not want the trials of the moment to distract them from living a life of obedience to God. Some may be experiencing those hardships. And as I said a moment ago, you may question whether or not if it has any benefit in living for the Lord in a time that we are living right now. But Peter is offering them something that I want to give you this morning that we desperately all need in our life. We all need hope. We need hope in our life. I like what Warren Wearsby, how he described hope. And I'd like for you to listen to this definition that he said. Hope is not a sedative. It's not a shot of adrenaline. Hope is not a blood transfusion. Hope is like an anchor. It's our hope in Christ Jesus, and it stabilizes us in the storms of life, but unlike an anchor which holds us back, the hope in Jesus Christ moves us forward in our life. How true that statement and that definition is there, because it describes why the Lord gives us hope. Not just to sit in one place, but to move us forward where he wants us to go in our walk with Jesus Christ. Peter is reminding the people that Jesus has not abandoned them simply because that they are experiencing difficulties in their life and they feel assaulted by what they are going through. The moment in your life, this moment right now in your life, and I don't know where you're at, but this moment in your life does not affect your future, and I want you to know that. You may feel like that you are at the depth, or you may be at the dead end in your life, but I want you to know something. The Lord is here, and He is to remind you that you've got a hope beyond what you're going through right now in your life. You say, well, what do I need? Well, let's see what Peter offered the people in uh, uh, northern Turkey there. What words he gave them. 
Notice how he starts out in verse number 11. He says, dearly beloved. And that's where I want to stop for just a moment because if I can offer you anything from God this morning, it would be simply this. You are loved. You are loved in the beloved. I want you to know that. Peter was not just speaking for himself when he said dearly beloved, but he was reminding them that they were dearly beloved of the Father. That God was aware of their circumstances and their needs and that he loved them. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes we need to hear words like that to get us up and to get us moving and to get us to understand we're not forsaken. He still loves us even in the midst of our most difficult times as a matter of fact in first and second Peter the word loved or that God loved these people Peter mentions it eight times to continually remind them that they are loved of the Father now I want to tell you something there's really and truly nothing inherent in us that causes God to love us there's nothing there but he loves us because of Jesus Christ in our life we are accepted in the beloved if we are saved by the grace of God and I believe we need to get excited because we're loved that he loves us gosh that does a world of good to me When I hear that your dad loves you, your mom loves you, your grandparents love you, uh, doesn't that give you a little bit of a a, a little bit of adrenaline or a little bit of a desire to move forward, knowing that someone cares? I want you to know there is someone who does care. And that's the Lord this morning. Don't think. I think sometimes uh, we've got so used to saying that God is love and that God loves us that it just kind of runs off of us like water on a duck's back. We've got so used to hearing those words. But do you know how damnable you were before you came to Jesus Christ? If you realize that, then you would rejoice that He loves you, that He cares about you. See, I I, I love the idea of reminding myself daily that God favors me, that I'm forgiven of the Father. I'm accepted in the Beloved. These are things that come because He loves us, and we are loved. Peter wanted them to know more than anything else in the world that they were loved by God and he had not forgotten them and he they were still the apple of his eye I tell you I believe that every day in this world I'm living in I I, I look and I wonder God do you know what I'm going through oh yes he does he knows if your name is written in his hand that he knows what's going on in your life and he cares and he is uh, wanting to respond to you the first and the best way by reminding you that he loves you you're loved but not only that notice what he says after he said dearly beloved he said I beseech you I beg you now now listen to what he was doing here he's calling them uh, to an invitation he's calling them to listen to his words that he's getting ready to speak to them and he says I'm begging of you to listen to me because sometimes guys we listen but we don't hear we allow words to come in but those words do not have any emphasis or any impact in our lives Paul is trying to remind them, I'm just not giving you lip service here by telling you that God loves you. I beg you to listen to what I'm going to say to you in the midst of your trauma, in the midst of your difficulty. I want you to hear this. Listen to me. Notice what he says. You are strangers and you're pilgrims. He's going to help them here. See, He is calling them sojournerers. 
And this describes someone who is only temporarily in a place because their home is somewhere else. Now, now listen to what he's telling them. He's telling them that you're an alien. You are a visiting alien in this world right here. And you need to understand that it's just for a period of time that you're going to be here. I'm going to tell you on the authority of God's Word, church, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I'm telling you, this world is not my home. I remember uh, and looking and, and reading about the story of Abraham. Do you remember what Abraham said? Abraham said, I am looking for a city. A city whose builder and maker is God. And he was nothing more than a sojourner on this earth right here. But he says, I'm continually going forward to the day that I go home to my place. You see, we are resident aliens whose citizenship is in another country. We're out of place here. We really and truly don't belong. To be a sojourner means that you are beside the people. Uh, or beside the house, excuse me. See, we're in the world, but we're not part of the world. I'm, I'm here, but I'm not in the house. I'm part of the meaning of people, but I am not, then they are not my people. Do you remember when Abraham died? One of the most wonderful statements about Abraham's death is this. He went home to his people. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, guys, that's exactly what's happening in this life right here. We continue living... We're going to start seeing loved ones and friends that is going to leave this place here. And after a while, I'm going to promise you, the older you get, you're going to discover there's going to be more folks there than they are here that is a part of your family. And the reality of it is, is that we need to be reminded that this is not our home, that we're simply just passing through here, that this residence is not temp uh, permanent, but it is temporary. And when we understand that, it will affect the way we live our life here. Because we understand, I'm just here for a period of time. I look at it and I think I'm, I'm on a mission. I, I like to think that, that, I, that I'm on a mission. And, uh, and in this mission, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, God has given me a, a goal, and God's given me a work, and God's given me time to be able to do particular things. But I'm going to tell you, there's times that I don't feel at home in this world uh, anymore with it. Remember the old story about the missionary that was coming home on a boat and he had been serving in a foreign land for him and his wife for many many years and as they were coming on uh, the ship was coming into the dock all of a sudden there was a, a band out there playing and everyone was cheering and all of a sudden they looked on the other side of the bay, uh, on the boat there, and there was a dignitary there. Everybody there was there to welcome him back. Oh, they had the pomp and the circumstance. They had the cheers, and everybody was so happy to see this dignitary coming back from where he had been overseas. That poor little old missionary and his wife, they walked down the gangplank. There wasn't anybody there to meet him. Kind of started feeling a little bit sorry for himself. There ain't nobody here. Nobody cares. Nobody is interested. Until his wife looked at him and said, You're not home yet. You're not home yet. I'm going to tell you, one day there's going to be a celebration that's going to take place. One day there's going to be a welcome that's going to be the greatest welcome that you ever heard in your life. One day there's going to be a time and a place when you enter into the presence of God and you can say with a surety, I'm home now. I'm home. 
I'm home. Now listen to what uh, Peter's doing to these, uh, the, uh, to these Christians who are alienated out here in Turkey. You're not home yet, guys. You're, you're, you're pilgrims. You're strangers. This isn't your permanent dwelling place here. St- remind yourself. This is not the way that it's always going to be. Amen. I, I tell you, I find myself with Daddy's passing, I find myself every day kind of just missing him a little bit more. A, a little bit more every day about it. Uh, but not only him, I begin to think about all of the ones that God has brought into my life that have gone on to be with the Lord. I tell you what, I'm looking forward to that home going at one day that is promised to us. Don't get adjusted to this world. Don't put your don't 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 put your roots too deep here, guys. The deeper you put them, the harder it's going to be for you to be able to be a different person and to make the impact with your life the way that God wants you to do. You need to free yourself up so God can use you in any and every way possible that He can in His life. Because our time is only limited here. We're just passing through. Just passing through. Now listen to what He tells them to do. Listen there in verse number 11 again. He says, I want you to abstain from fleshly lust." that is warring against your soul. He's speaking of the body. You you know, I, I hear people make statements about the Bible that God tells us to do this. But how in the world does God intend for us to do it? I'm going to tell you something. Grace makes no demand that it doesn't provide resources for enablement in your life. God's not going to tell us to do something that we cannot do. Now, we may not be able to do it in our flesh, but we can do it by the Spirit of God and the grace of God in our life, and we can be victorious in our life. Every one of us needs to hear those words. Now, Peter doesn't share specifically what that lust that he talks about is. But he tells us that we need to be constantly holding ourselves back from fleshly lust in our life. Holding back. Whether you know it or not, there is a sinful pull in our lives that is trying to pull us away from Christ. It is pulling us, and we need to understand that we need to hold back so that we do not yield to that that desire and those things that is pulling at our life. I'm going to tell you, when I came to Christ as a young man, I discovered that there were some things that were still in my life. There were some desires and some and some pulls that were trying to pull me away from my commitment. Trying to. Jesus on the mainland, tell him what you want.